What are the rocks telling us? Mica is a flaky, soft, and shiny mineral that can often be seen glistening in beach sand, but it isn't found in desert sands. Our guest and his geology students were able to show with a series of simple experiments that mica from one of the Grand Canyon's formations is great evidence that it was created during a worldwide flood. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, mica, small but mighty, with Dr. John Whitmore. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. John Whitmore, is an active creationist researcher and writer. His research focuses on the geology of Noah's flood especially concerning the rocks of the Grand Canyon, which he has been visiting for over four decades. John started the geology program at Cedarville University in Ohio, where he has been teaching for over 30 years. He is also the editor for the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism, which is now located at the university. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Ray. It's great to be here today. You know, we're talking about something that I have to say, I don't know if I've ever talked about here on the program, and that is mica. What is mica? Yeah, mica is a very interesting mineral. It is a mineral that we find in rocks. Uh, if you have a granite countertop at home, uh, it's probably in that granite countertop. Uh, sometimes it can be silver colored, sometimes it can be black but uh, it's just a small, uh, usually inconspicuous mineral, but I think it has an important story to tell us. Well, that's fascinating. Let's see what Micah can tell us about okay. the Earth. All right, so this is what uh, Micah is. It's, uh, there's a, a piece of Micah, a flake of Micah right in there. It's, it's not very big. We're looking at this under the microscope. Um, when we uh, collect uh, samples of rock. Sometimes we slice those samples of rock and polish them down very thin and put them on a microscope slide uh, so we can actually see right through the rock and just see some of the individual mineral grains in the rock. Uh, so things like this right here, that would be a sand grain. Here's another uh, sand grain right there to give you an idea how big these things are. Those are sand grains. And right here in the middle, this is a, this is a piece of mica right here. And mica um, is a very soft mineral. Uh, there's a scale that geologists have called the Mohs scale. If you've ever taken a geology class, uh, your instructor probably had you memorize the Mohs scale. It's a scale that goes from one to 10. Uh, the softest mineral is one. Uh, the hardest mineral, diamond, is number 10. And mica, has a hardness of about two and a half. And I teach my geology students in the lab that your fingernail has about a hardness of two and a half. So uh, it, mica is fairly soft. Uh, you can scratch it easily like a, a knife blade or, or something like that would scratch uh, the mica very easily. And the other thing that's kind of unusual about mica is it often comes in books. Uh, so I have a book right here and this, this book has pages in it and you can actually peel flakes of mica apart. So my students uh, will do this in the lab when they are identifying different minerals. They can actually peel uh, the pages of a book of mica apart uh, as, as it is. Now, is this something that when you say peel it back, it, are they doing it in a microscope? Or is this something you can see? Uh, it comes you, can, in you can have a fairly big piece of mica. I've got pieces of mica in the lab that are fairly big but you can peel them apart and, and they can be paper thin. You can hold it up and see right through it. What does Micah tell us about the earth and particularly- so that's the, what we're gonna talk about record. today. Um, 
I have, I've been studying something called the Coconino Sandstone. And uh, one of the things uh, that, that I'm interested in is trying to show that this sandstone was made underwater. Now, what does that mean, Coconino? Is that where it's from? Is that yeah. just the name of the layer? This is a, a picture of the Grand Canyon right here, and the Coconino Sandstone is right there. It's uh, in the upper part of the Grand Canyon. You can actually see it as you look across the canyon. It, it occurs in the cliff back there as well. And uh, the Coconino Sandstone is interesting because uh, it's a formation that the conventional geologist or evolutionist will use to say that the Bible's false. And the reason they pick that particular sandstone is they think that sandstone uh, was made in a desert. And of course, you cannot have a desert forming during the middle of Noah's flood when everything is covered with water. And so scientists have actually used the Coconino to say the Bible's false. And I, I can show you quotes and, and so forth where people have actually used this particular sandstone. And so it's been uh, about uh, 2005 or so, 2006, I started to study uh, the Coconino Sandstone. I had a couple uh, guys that helped me. Uh, Paul Garner uh, right here is from England. Uh, Ray Strom uh, from Canada. Uh, those two guys helped me uh, study this formation uh, over uh, quite a few years. Does it occur only in the Grand Canyon or is this something you can find all over the world? It's named the Coconino in Arizona, but I've actually been able to trace it uh, through New Mexico, up into Colorado, actually up into the Dakotas as well. It's called by different names, uh, but it's still the very same rock layer. So it forms a, a huge sheet across the western United States. And John, how do you look at this, this layer of sandstone and refute the evolutionists claim that, well, this proves that there was no flood? Well, one of the things we're going to take a look at today is uh, some thin sections of rock that we made from the Coconino. So we actually got permits in the Grand Canyon uh, to collect um, uh, rock samples from this sandstone right here. And we collected it in other places outside the Grand Canyon as well. But we collected these samples, uh, cut them down uh, very thin, polished them down. And Ray Strom uh, actually did that uh, in his lab uh, up in Calgary. And then we looked at them under the microscope. And one of the things that we started to see under the micro microscope almost immediately was that these samples were loaded with mica, and especially a particular kind of mica called muscovite. Okay, and so the mica is in the sandstone, but, mm -hmm. you know, again, Someone like me, that doesn't say, yeah. well, that it's in the water, it's in the desert, or... This is why this is significant. There was a book that was published uh, a few years back in 2008 uh, by two geologists, Young and Sturley. And they have this quote in their book. These two geologists are trying to say that uh, Noah's flood is, is not real, that, you know, maybe it's just a story, but it's not meant to be taken literally, and so on. And so these two geologists are trying to present geological evidence that uh, the earth is very old and that the earth's rocks have formed over a long period of time. And this is what they said on page 305 of this book. Mainstream sedimentologists, those are people that, that study sediments, uh, feel that the aeolian, that is windblown nature of such accumulations, uh, like the Coconino sandstone, is well-founded. The very fine sand size of these formations has a uniform grain size that is characteristic of windblown sand in general. The grains consist of resistant quartz. Less resistant mica grains and ultrafine clay particles have been abraded to oblivion and or wafted off site by the wind. And so there's a couple interesting things that I want to call your attention to uh, in this quote. Number one, they say uniform grain size. And then number two, they talk about uh, a lot of quartz grains. Quartz is another type of mineral, and the coconino is mostly made of quartz. But they also talk about the mica grains in there as well. Uh, you will find that there's mostly quartz in there, and you will not find any mica. And so um, we want to check, check the rocks and see if this is actually true. We want to look at the rocks 
uh, to see if there is any mica in there. So their argument is that if, if it's wind blown layer, you're going to find this quartz, maybe it's heavier, they called it resistant, right. but the mica is going to be blown away. So. That's right, or, or because mica is really soft and quartz is hard that it will just get chewed up and, okay. and ground up. From that, okay. Yep. And so uh, what we wanted to do was check this out. We wanted to see if things like sand dunes uh, have mica grains in them. And so we actually went to a, a number of different sand dunes, uh, mostly in the United States. We looked at some outside of, of North America as well. But we wanted to see if there was mica in there. Uh, we also looked at beach sand and ocean sand and so forth and looked to see if there was mica in there. And in all these studies, we couldn't find any mica in the desert deposits. Uh, we found lots of mica in beach sands. In fact, you can go to most, most beaches or even most rivers. I was on the Colorado River just a few weeks ago and I could stand down and look at the river sand and see these little shiny flecks glistening in the sand. And those are little mica grains. Uh, they reflect light kind of like a mirror and you can actually see it even with your naked eye. And uh, just, you can see the sun kind of glistening off of there. But when you go to desert sand dunes, those dunes don't usually have mica in them. And so water laid uh, sand deposits usually have mica, desert sand deposits uh, do not. And so we kept finding all these mica grains in the Coconino. And so it's a, it's, it's a big clue to how the Coconino sandstone was laid down, how it was formed. Okay. so. That um, kind of brings everything together there. They're claiming in the book what you, what you found, that mica is not in windblown, but the Coconino is supposed to be windblown, and well, yet there's mica there. <laughs> the thing is, Ray, these guys wrote that, but they didn't actually look under the microscope to see if there was mica in the Coconino, right? Okay, okay. And so as we started looking at the Coconino, we say, oh, this is kind of interesting. Look at all this mica in here. Okay. And so it has some significant implications. Mm. Now, I'd like to show you what we found under the microscope. And so let me, let me go up and, and show you some, some microscope slides. So first of all, we wanted to do some experiments. And I'm a university professor and I, I usually have uh, students that are looking for projects to do and so forth. So I wanted my students to investigate uh, this issue of mica. And so uh, this is a pickle jar right here, just a one gallon pickle jar. And you can see a little bit of sand down there at the bottom. We didn't put very much sand in there, but this sand uh, has flakes of mica in there. So, so I found this mica in South Carolina, a really nice quartz sand full of mica. And you can't see the propeller, but there's a little motor on the, on the lid of the, the jar right there, and there's a propeller in there. And the student rigged this up so the propeller would spin around, the airplane propeller, and it would make the sand go around the bottom of the jar. And I, you know, this was the student's project, a student experiment. And I said, you know, see what happens to the mica. And he ran this thing for a couple weeks and, and came back and reported to me, I, I can't find any mica in there. And so I said, well, you know, you're going to have to maybe check it a little more often to actually see what happens to it and how long it takes the sand to, to chew the mica grains up. And so he sampled it a little more often. And, and what he was able to find is that the mica flakes get chewed up in less than two days. Oh, wow. So it really does happen according yeah. to the theory that the wind causes the yep. bigger, yeah. And so the, the quartz sand grains are really hard. The mica, as we talked about, is really soft. And as the quartz and the mica collide, they, they chew the mica grains up and, and, you know, just grind them down to very small particles that you can't even see. And so that was step one, and we were able to confirm our observations that we saw in the deserts uh, that, you know, why mica, you know, isn't in desert sand. So I had a second uh, student, and he took the same pickle jar, and we put this mica-rich sand in the pickle jar, and this time we filled it with water. And we turned the, the jar sideways, and this is a rock tumbler uh, right here turn the jar sideways and put it on the rock tumbler so this jar would turn around and around and around. 
And you could actually see the flakes of mica in the water floating around. They're silver and sparkly, so you could see them uh, really nice. And um, the, uh, this would go around and around, and we didn't actually have to sample it because we could see the mica in there. And believe it or not, this student ran this experiment for a year, 24-7. This pickle jar was turning around in the rock tumbler, and we still saw mica in there. And so we actually were able to publish this in a conventional journal um, that, you know, the, the reason this gets chewed up really fast is because the grains of sand are colliding fairly energetically. Uh, here, the water is cushioning the contact, and so they don't hit each other as hard, and the mica lasts for a long time. So this experiment is showing us that in deserts, mica disappears, and in water, the mica can be preserved for a very long time. I think that's interesting that you picked a year because, you know, with Noah's flood <laughs> being on the earth and, of course, the water being constantly <laughs> agitated and moving, it seems well, to... The fitting. truth is, I picked a year because this thing was running outside my office, <laughs> and it was noisy. And I said, all right, that's, this is enough. <laughs> a year, yeah, yeah. that'd be enough. All right, so let's look under the microscope. Um, we went to a variety of different places. Uh, we looked at some sandstones, uh, including the Coconino in Arizona, but we looked at a variety of other sandstones as well. Uh, both in North America and in Europe, and we studied a number of sand dunes. So this isn't a study that, you know, we just looked at, you know, one little thing somewhere. We, we really tried to, to look at a large number to see if our conclusions uh, were good over a wide range of rocks. Okay, so this is uh, looking under the microscope. Uh, this is a little bit different lighting in each of these. And here's our mica flake right there. And here's the same mica flake with a different kind of lighting. And you can see how it's even peeling apart uh, right in here. Yeah. How the flakes, yeah. the pages of the book are coming apart. Uh, here's another mica flake, another mica flake. And I have lots of these. And the reason I have lots of these, you're going to get tired of looking at them. But the reason I have lots of them is to just show you that we found this all over the place. It's not just in one or two slides. Again, here's some mica uh, right here. Same kind of view right here. This is under a different type of lighting and you can see the pages are all yeah. split apart right in right there. there. A bunch of mica here, I have red arrows where the, where the mica is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes under this cross polarized light, the mica shows up in these brilliant yellow or mm -hmm. pink uh, colors. It's really, really fun to find that under the microscope. Uh, these red arrows are showing where the mica is. It's not very big. Uh, but it's present. There's mica right there, squeezed in between a couple sand grains, a nice flake uh, right there. Here's some other um, sandstones. Look at the giant mica flakes that are in there. So that would say again that um, chances are this sandstone was laid down in water That's correct. because the mica is preserved. Uh, understand the conventional view is that these are desert sand preserved fossilized desert sand dunes. But it can't be the case because of all the mica uh, that we're finding in there. So and here's, uh, here's some more from England. Uh, mica uh, right here, mica grain right there. And again, this is showing us that these sandstones are made underwater and not in a desert. That's fascinating, John. We have to stop right there and take a break. Stay with us more about mica after these messages. I hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org origins. 
One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. John Whitmore, who's been sharing with us about the soft mineral mica mm -hmm. and what it says about the geologic record. That's right. Uh, Ray, I became involved in this study by studying the, first studying the Coconino sandstone of Grand Canyon. And that's a sandstone formation that conventional geology would say is made uh, by sand in a desert. So they would say that the Coconino is a fossilized desert sand dunes. And as uh, I began to study this with a team of other scientists, we began to find this very soft mineral mica under the microscope. You can't really see it in the outcrop very well, but when you slice the rock and prepare it for looking uh, at under the microscope, you can find these mica grains. And here's some mica grains uh, from some uh, sandstones from England. Uh, so we looked at a number of these in our, in our first session uh, together, and it's this nice, straight, uh, flaky mineral. It's fairly soft. And I talked about uh, an experiment that some of my students ran uh, where they put uh, mica-rich sand in a pickle jar and used an airplane propeller, and the mica disappeared within days uh, in our simulated uh, sand dune experiment. Well, and then the data, the, the data from the actual sand dunes, which mm -hmm. no one disputes, is that there's right. almost no mica in any yeah. sand. And so we, we looked at dozens of different sand dunes, uh, collected samples from those, did not find any mica in those sand dunes except where there's a really close source of the, of the mica from a, a granite or something like that. But uh, primarily, uh, mica does not occur in sand dunes because it, it gets all ground up. It's like a sandblaster. And these, these sand dunes are all over the world in, in deserts, and these sandstone layers mm -hmm. we know are all over the world, and you've That's brought, right. brought data from yeah. that as well. We've been studying sand dunes in the western part of North America and also some uh, sandstones in Europe as well. Uh, most geologists would say that these uh, cross-bedded sandstones, and what I mean by cross-bedding is uh, the, the sand layers are at an angle, uh, instead of flat, they're, they're angled like this. I'd say these cross-bedded sandstones mostly represent desert deposits. You know, it's fascinating to me because our God is, is great and awesome when we talk about the immensity of God and his almighty yeah. power, and yet we see something like this mica, this tiny little substance yeah. that it can be big enough, to, you know, layers of it, big chunks of it, as you said, but, but really this soft mineral, one of the softest minerals, easily destroyed, and yet there it is as a testimony to the truth of Scripture and to, right. to the evidence that God is the one who did all these things. So conventional geology gave us a challenge. And I really like challenges as a scientist. Mm -hmm. I, I love to investigate things and to dig into things and, and so forth. And so the, the implications of the study uh, that we made is that in a desert, uh, mica disappears really fast. And that's because... Uh, the sand grains, the quartz sand grains are running into the mica and it's just like a sandblaster. It uh, just tears the soft mica grains apart. And so it just doesn't last very long in the desert. And we did experiments to, to show that. We collected desert sand and looked in the desert sand uh, to demonstrate that as well. And then the other piece of our study is to look at the sandstones. And we found lots of mica in the sandstones. And you know, the mica in the sandstones means that it's not a desert environment. And so we did a second experiment where we put the mica-rich sand in water and watched it tumble over and over and over for a year. And the mica, you know, lasted. It didn't seem to come apart or really do anything at all for over a year when we stopped our experiment. So it seems to say that the sandstone layers were formed in water. That's right. And not by wind. That's right. And so I think this is just one of the things in these sandstone layers. There's some other things too. But one of the things that we can easily understand is that these 
uh, sandstones formed underwater. And of course, uh, we think that they formed underwater uh, during Noah's flood. And the exciting thing about this, uh, you know, a challenge was presented to us. A challenge was presented. These are desert sandstones. It proves the, the account of Noah's flood in the Bible is false. We went and investigated this sandstone as a scientist, began to dig into it, uh, collected samples, looked at it under the microscope and so forth. And I think the challenge now is back on the conventional evolutionary community to explain if these are desert sandstones, why do they have mica and dolomite and other things in them? So we've, we've taken the, this evidence and really made it a strength for the biblical model instead of a weakness. John, are you aware, and just real quick, because we're almost out of time, are you aware of any major sandstone layer that is absent of mica that would appear, possibly appear to be made by the wind? We've looked at a number of the more famous sandstone layers and all of them appear to have uh, mica in them. Um, and so, you know, we keep looking and we keep finding <laughs> mica. And it's not that, you know, we just find a little bit here, a little bit there. We're finding it under every mic microscope slide that we prepare. Well, um, that's wonderful. I love the way the smallest of things testify to the truth of God. John, I want to thank you for sure. being on the program. You're welcome, Ray. Hope you can join us again sometime. Good to be here. In the layers of rock around the world, the soft mineral mica is a powerful testimony to the fact that the whole earth was underwater, just like the Bible records in the story of Noah's flood. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this Creation TV program on the air. Your support both prayerfully and financially make a big impact. So let's work together and reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2202, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.